Photographic Composition, Lecture 4, Still Life and Product, Part 1. This image by Edward Weston is about as simple as you can get as far as a photograph is concerned. It is of one object, a chambered nautilus seashell, against a completely black background. And its simplicity is what gives it its power. It's all about the shape and the way that the light plays against its surfaces. It has depth. Um, and because it was shot at a very uh, small aperture, um, extremely uh, clear. This is by L.J.M. Daguerre, and from the very beginning, uh, photographers used still lifes to um, uh, develop their uh, processes. This was made in the 1830s, um, before Daguerre released his invention to the public. Um, the advantage in uh, photographing a still life is that nothing moves. If you have the camera stationary, all the objects are stationary, everything will stay nice and clear. This was essential because the emulsions that um, Daguerre and other um, early photographers um, used were um, extremely slow, uh, not very light sensitive at all. This is by William Henry Fox Talbot, the British photographer who also uh, came out with a different version of photography in the 18 in 1839. Um, he too um, used still lives, uh, mostly made around his family estate, Laycock Abbey. Um, this is from a uh, series that he made um, and released right after the um, he released his invention, um, called the Pencil of Nature. This is by Karl Blasfeld, a German photographer um, who concentrated primarily on uh, plant life and animal life shown in great detail. Um, throughout his career, he stuck to a very simple strategy, photographing objects generally against a contrasting background, in this case, a white background, with um, particular attention paid to the light playing against the surfaces. And as a result, in this case, the, the object um, really pops and is very clear against that white background. This is by Edward Steichen, made in the um, early 20th century. And if th this was an image that took uh, many hours um, to create, um, it the, the lighting was extremely low um, in intensity, and um, it apparently took hours. It is possible to see, if you look very carefully at it, that some of the areas are slightly out of focus, and that's because during the time that it was photographed, the petals were actually deteriorating. This is also by Steichen, of um, a Rodin sculpture of um, the writer Balzac. Um, again, really simple, although this is made outdoors. Um, in the landscape, the landscape is really a secondary um, component, and all of the attention is paid on the sculpture, um, which is, does not occupy that large a, a part of the, the frame, but dominates it nonetheless. Part of this is, has to do with the quality of the light coming in from the side. A very dramatic image. On the other end of the scale, Aceh's photograph of a sculpture in one of the parks in, in uh, Paris um, is extremely low key, and part of this has to do with the fact that it was shot on an overcast day. Um, the, there are no harsh shadows. Um, there are details virtually everywhere, and it's a very matter-of-fact but precisely seen um, image with the uh, added bonus of another sculpture in the background. Also by Ache, um, he was very interested in um, store windows, among other things, and um, in this case, um, drawn to the mannequins, and the uh, layering of the reflection of the uh, buildings and trees across the street, overlaying the, uh, the mannequins. This is a uh, fairly typical commercial um, image used to promote products, made in the late 19th century or early 20th century. And um, it's fairly straightforward except for the floor, which if you look carefully, geometrically, just couldn't have happened the way it did. This was, is actually a, an early example of a um, 
rather crude cut and paste job, but in the days when you actually cut and pasted um, images together. This is by Heinrich Kuhn, and um, this is made in a process called autochrome, which actually used small pieces of glass um, on the emulsion and created a, a color image. Um, the, the glass was in, in different colors and, and allowed different um, wavelengths of light to strike the emulsion differently, and as a result, you ended up with a color image. Very soft, um, very almost impressionistic, um, and yet it's clearly a photograph. This is by Paul Strand, um, who uh, photographed um, objects, both natural and man-made, um, in great close-up, in extreme close-up at times, and in this case, a, a row of um, a couple of rows of uh, typewriter keys, and um, in the process, elevates it to something other than um, the simple object that it is to begin with. Uh, this is by Weston, again, and not unlike the chambered nautilus that we saw um, a few slides ago. Um, it's a toilet, but um, as seen by Weston, it has a monumental quality to it. Um, it becomes um, sculpture and transcends its very everyday um, uh, existence. Again, the light is um, absolutely essential to making this work. This is by Paul Outerbridge, an American photographer, and it is a, believe it or not, a saltine cracker box where the packaging has been removed and it's just the box. Um, but because of the way he treats the object, it becomes something much more solid and monumental. Um, also, uh, the shadows from the box itself and from other objects um, make for a very interesting uh, geometric uh, uh, confluence of, of events. Um, it turns it into a very compelling image. This is by Bernice Abbott, who, among other things, experimented with um, scientific photography um, in the 1930s. Here she focused on soap bubbles um, with an, the intention of exploring the various shapes that the bubbles make when seen in extreme close-up. Henri Curtez was a Hungarian photographer who lived in Paris for many years until he was forced out during the Second World War and lived in New York for the, the last days of his life. Um, this was made in Paris and um, using extremely simple um, objects. We've got a fork lying against a, um, a bowl on a table. Um, the play of, of the shadows um, and the objects are really what it all becomes. It's almost abstract, but not quite. And um, an extremely powerful image from very humble um, materials. Um, this is also by Cortez. It's made of um, Mond the artist Mondrian's studio. And the, uh, uh, the, tul the, the tulip is actually um, ceramic. It was apparently a gift from someone um, and very colorful. Mondrian found it offensive and decided that he had to paint it white. As a result, we have this very sculptural um, looking object. Um, but we also see it, it is a still life, but it's a still life that includes a um, considerable amount of its context. Um, the light is, is sensational coming in from um, the right and um, largely backlit. Gives it a great deal of depth. This is by Man Ray. It's a photogram, what he referred to as rayograms. And um, it's a Again, very simple objects. It's a gyroscope, and um, it looks like maybe a, a part of a watch, and um, a, a pair of hands, more than likely his. Um, photograms are made by um, placing objects on photosensitive paper, um, exposing the, uh, the paper to light uh, briefly, and then processing it. Um, as a regular print, and as a result, we end up with these silhouettes like this. Walker Evans was um, best known for his architecture, um, but he also moved in closer at times, as he did with this um, image of a small town 
um, photo studio, which um, not only tells us it's a studio by the text, but also gives us a sense of the character of the place by showing all of these um, uh, tiny prints of, of people who lived in the area. Evans in the 40s also became the uh, photo editor of Fortune magazine, and as such was able to um, create his own assignments. One of them was on um, everyday tools, such as this wrench. Um, used a very simple strategy to um, light it. It's supported by um, a post underneath it. You can see a little bit of its shadow, uh, but as a result, it, it is primary, pretty much a uh, um, an object floating against a, uh, um, a background. This is by Imogene Cunningham, who was a California photographer from San Francisco, and um, she was um, also drawn to uh, flowers and plants um, and other objects and, and shooting them in extreme close-up. Um, as with all of these photographers, the quality of the light and how um, she could man manipulate it um, was of paramount importance. And this is also by Cunningham um, of a uh, domestic scene. Um, the sculpture next to the fireplace is Brancusi's Bird in f uh, Flight. And um, uh, interesting that she chose to draw in also the, uh, the tree um, from outside. And we have this wonderful light coming in through windows. This um, basically product shot by um, Horst, um, although it's not really um, a still life because there's a, a, a live model, um, she's really treated more as a mannequin. And um, what becomes um, essential to this image is the quality of the light. Certainly her gesture is part of it, um, but also the straps for the, uh, um, the girdle um, and the way they are draped over the counter in the foreground. This is by Herbert List. Um, this was a product photo of um, sunglasses, um, I believe made in a, uh, next to a, uh, um, a Swiss lake. Very simple, straightforward. Um, it's about place, it's also about the objects. Werner Mantz was a uh, photographer and instructor at the Bauhaus in Germany in the 20s and 30s, um, concentrated largely on architecture, worked with Gropius and other um, architects of the Bauhaus, and um, as such also made um, a lot of details or vignettes of uh, various elements of the architecture, such as this with the door, um, the street lamp, and um, the shadow of the street lamp, which is really as much as anything, um, the subject of the picture. This is by Margaret Burkwhite and um, of apparently turbines. And um, it, this is really about the, uh, the sensual shapes um, and the way the light plays on them. Very powerful image. This is by Harold Edgerton. Edgerton was, among other things, the inventor of the strobe. His objective in uh, creating a light that had a very short burst was to see phenomena like this, where we see a, a bullet passing through an apple, um, in order to better understand exactly what happened to the objects on impact like this. Before um, images like this were made, no one really knew. And um, there are hundreds and hundreds of experiments that he performed on various objects. In this case, a bullet passing through a, an apple um, the strobe allowed it to absolutely be frozen and um, reveals to us what we couldn't see with the naked eye. 